morning uh, from Arizona, or good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Janine Noble, uh, and I will be presenting an introduction to musculoskeletal ultrasound today. Um, most of you have probably, if you're attending this, most of you have heard something about musculoskeletal ultrasound or MSK ultrasound, as we tend to call it, because musculoskeletal is a mouthful of words. Um, hopefully this will give you, if you already have some knowledge, hopefully this will increase it a little bit. If you don't have much, then hopefully we can show you how it can enhance your practice or however you treat your patients. Uh, share my screen here. I'm not used to working on a fancy machine, so. Um, There we go. Um, my background is I am a physical therapist by education. I went to school later in life. And as an older student, um, I was the third oldest by two months, which was a very important two months. Um, as an older student, I don't know if uh, some of you are in this category yet, but it takes us longer you know, to remember things. So I had to work a little bit harder than a lot of people to remember a lot of stuff. So I worked closer with the teachers. In the end of school, one of the instructors had somebody come in who was doing musculoskeletal ultrasound. It was the absolute coolest thing I think I had ever seen in my life, that you could put this ultrasound down, because all I knew it for was babies, but you could put this ultrasound down and see what was going on inside the body. You could watch muscles move, you could watch fluid, you could watch all kinds of things. So I was, fortunate enough to be able to work with this group for a while and then uh, from there was able to work with a number of physicians and uh, different providers to hone my skills because back then in the year 2000 there was very very little information the University of Michigan had pretty much the only thing that was available and so over the years it has come into use more and more. Now in Australia, in Canada, in your um, MSK ultrasound is used quite extensively because they don't rely so much on MRIs. But in the US, um, it is not done as commonly as it is in these other areas. So why would you even use uh, musculoskeletal uh, ultrasound? Well, think of this, let's go to this scenario. A man walks into a bar, and, oh wait, wrong story. A patient walks into a clinic, into your clinic, and comes in with a shoulder issue. You've got your normal thing, it says eval and treat. So you take a look at the order. You do the patient, you go through all your subjective testing uh, and your objective testing, your questions, and you determine this patient has bursitis. Now, do you really know there's bursitis in there? Not really, because you can't tell for sure. Do they maybe have a tear? Do they maybe have something else that you can't see that's going on, but you suspect it because of what you do? With ultrasound, with a quick diagnostic tool, you can plop that transducer onto the shoulder, run through an exam, and be able to tell, you know what, there's a partial tear here, or you know what, this is worse than what I thought, or you know what, you're kind of whiny, it's just bursitis, let's get you some exercises. So in a quick 10 minute exam, you have determined not only, you not only can tell them what you think it is, you can tell them what you know it is. And that is the beauty of this. I have been impressed with this ever since the beginning. So it provides real time images. The nice thing about MSK ultrasound is it's dynamic. It's not a static thing like an MRI, you can move around. Um, also, uh, just as a little side note, if they didn't, I will not be able to check the chat box because I can't multitask like that. If you have any questions and we have time at the end, then we'll go to the question and answer box and look at some of those. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, so it's also, it's a non-invasive medical test. So you don't have to put needles in there. You don't have to put anything in, but it helps to diagnose and treat musculoskeletal conditions. So the advantages are it is dynamic. You can move around. It's not just lay there. If you have something that only happens when you raise your arm or when you stand up or when you flex your knee, 
um, you can get into that position while you're doing your scan. There are no contraindications to this. This is not like um, there is no radiation. So it can be used quite easily for post-surgical patients. This is some of the beauty of that. I had a patient yesterday. He had had a total knee and the doctor was concerned about some this retinaculum or something. So no scatter, nothing. It, very easy to visualize everything that's going on. It is portable and inexpensive. And we'll talk a little bit about machines in a minute. It's great for the claustrophobic patient and the post-surgical patients, even with uh, providers that are not all that keen because it's hard now because so many don't know how to read ultrasound. It's hard for them to accept this as a really good diagnostic tool. Um, but even uh, providers who or anyone who has a claustrophobic patient or has a post-surgical that can't get an MRI or a pacemaker, we see a lot of patients with pacemakers, those patients too can reap the benefit of having an exam done with musculoskeletal ultrasound. And then this is beautiful. The real-time imaging is excellent for dry needling and guided injections. Now, I know that there are states, and you can close your ears if you're in some of those California, New York states that can't do dry needling, but this puts it to a whole other level to be able to get the ultrasound there, take your needle in, and know exactly where you're going. Um, guided injections are how it kind of got into the U.S. into the, the provider market because they discovered they could get paid a lot more money by doing that. But that came down and we were able to get diagnostics in. But it, the preciseness and with all the new, the region medicine and the way things are going, it's important to be directly where you need to be. So you can look for fibrotic changes, for scar tissue, for that kind of thing, to be able to know exactly where to go. And the patients get better quicker. It, it's just seen it over and over. So why? Whoop. Oh, sorry, going the wrong way. Okay, there are a couple of disadvantages, not a whole lot, but one of the main disadvantages, this is only for superficial structures. With musculoskeletal ultrasound, you cannot look through bone. So as we'll see on the image in a little bit, bone will be at the bottom of the screen and we're always gonna look at bone and what's above the bone. So if there's, if you have a through and through fracture, we can't really tell. If you have a stress fracture, it's easily visible because you can only see that top part. So the top of the bone is magnified and it shows early arthritic changes. And then we can see all the soft tissue. So if there's internal derangement, um, th there are some limitations. The other thing is ultrasound in general, MSK or any other, is highly, highly operator dependent. If you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to get the best image. And the radiologist or to give your patient the best possible care, you need to know what you're doing. Now, one of the things, and I got caught up in there too, we think, you know, I was a PT. I had how much anatomy, you know, how hard can this be? Uh, you just pick it up. I know where things are. Well, it, those of you who have done it are probably chuckling right now because you know, putting this down and seeing the image on the screen is not the same as what you think. It, it's surprising. It's like, this isn't exactly where I thought it was. Um, this is, is moving a little bit different. So it's important to be trained properly for this. And that is just, that's what we offer is training uh, with this to help you become a better clinician and a better user of diagnostic musculoskeletal ultrasound. Uh, so why? Uh, this, oh, this is one of our, this is um, actually one of our students that we had who has just taken off with this. MSK ultrasounds allows you to do an accurate screening. And when you're beginning at this, it's like any other new skill that you're going to have. It's like palpation or manipulation or dry needling. You're not going to be the best at first. You're not going to take a weekend course and say, I can go out and, you know, check for itty bitty things, you know, tiny rotator cuff tears. Our goal first is, to learn how to screen the patient. Your goal in a clinic is how bad is what's coming in? So 85% of the time, you know that what comes into your clinic, you're gonna be able to treat and treat successfully. There are always gonna be those cases that it's a little more involved than what, um, 
than what you would like it to be. And it maybe needs to be sent back to the provider or on for additional imaging. But with this quick screening tool, is this normal? Is it within normal, somewhat normal? Is it pretty bad? You know, good versus bad is what it is. If it's really bad, you're probably gonna send it back to your provider, let your provider know so that they can get additional imaging. But you will stop a lot of MRIs by being able to take a look at this. Um, and, you know, knowing can we take care of this or do we need to send it back? So quicker diagnosis will give you a more focused treatment plan. And then you can identify those pathologies that need to go back. So what areas of the body can be visualized with musculoskeletal ultrasound? Well, everything. There are limitations within these. So we can look at shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, hip, knee, foot, and ankle. Stuff in every area there. In the shoulder, the limitation is generally the labrum. Um, it's inside the bone, it gets in. Now there, there are some people doing some studies that they're able to see this a little more. I'm not one of those people. So I, you know, if you're suspecting labrum, you probably want to get an MRI. You know, internal derangement, you will not be able to see, but every rotator cuff tendon and the biceps tendon and the deltoid, everything in there that's a superficial to bone can be visualized with ultrasound. In the elbow, pretty much everything. In the wrist and hand, that gets a little bitty. We do more of a focused exam in there because most of the stuff that comes in is going to be a deep veins or a carpal tunnel. So we, at first, we stick to these, you know, easier things, let's call them, or more superficial things. In the hip, uh, you can see the labrum, the joint, glute, gluteal tears, all kinds of lateral pathology, posterior, the hamstrings, or the ischial tuberosity, or the glute maximus. In the knee, pretty much everything except the ACL. Now, to see the ACL, you need to go into extreme flexion and try and get a patient with an acute ACL into extreme flexion. It isn't going to happen. That's still an MRI kind of call. And then foot and ankle, um, perineal tendons, posterior tib, Achilles, plantar fascia, neuromas. It is beautiful for the perineal tendons. Any foot and ankle, this is awesome for because uh, MRI will miss some of this going around the lateral malleolus. And with ultrasound, you not only see, but you're going to do motion as it's getting in through there. So you can see everything that goes in, goes on with that. Um, into ultrasound now and how we do this, we tend to use a linear array probe. Um, it's also referred to as the magic wand or you know different names for it, but it actually is a transducer. Um, the one that we tend to use for most musculoskeletal is a linear probe, and that will be the one on the left straight line across because so many things we almost everything we look at is superficial uh, the curved probe on the right is meant for deeper structures any of you have had a baby ultrasound or a kidney ultrasound or you know liver uh, they're going to use a curved probe because those structures are deeper and you can see on the left how the beam the sound waves that come out are more focused into this area on the right they spread out so you don't get as good a view of superficial things with that curved probe. There are some fine lines in there. The hip can be a little deeper, fluffier patients. You may need to use a curved array to get to that. But this higher frequency, and that would be like eight to about 13 megahertz um, is best. And probably 85% of what we do is used with that probe. So as you're looking at this, um, and I have an ultrasound here, this is a probe and the beam that comes through here, now this is where we get kind of lost. The beam is not the width of this, of this whole thing. The beam is a slice. It's a one millimeter slice that goes through that. Now, if it were the whole width of this, anybody could do ultrasound. Um, but unfortunately, this is what makes it a skilled thing is to be able to take that slice and see everything that you need to in what we're doing and think about it. For tendons, for ligaments, for so many of the things that we do, it's this big. It's not, you know, like a kidney where it's this, well, however big a kidney is. Uh, it's not that wide. It is a very thin slice. So we're doing small controlled motions as we're looking at everything. We have two scan planes, and this can be a little confusing to people. Uh, we do a long axis and a short axis, uh, which is also longitudinal or cross-section or transverse plane. This gets to be a little trickier if you're used to coronal and sagittal. 
we are doing everything in relationship to the structure that we're looking at. So if you're looking at the erector, well, we won't be looking at that. If we're looking at the flexor tendons in the, in the forearm, the probe, a long view, the fibers run this way. This will be our long axis view. Longitudinal, you're going to go in the same direction as the fibers. Now, on, on the back, where does the trapezius go? The trapezius runs this way. So you're not going to be going straight up and down the back. You're going to go in the direction of those fibers. So we do a long axis to the fibers, seeing all the fibers, or a cross section or a short axis view. So in that view, we'll see a little bit different. If you think about it kind of like a straw, um, if you're in long view, you'll see the length of the straw. And think of that beam as slicing through what you're looking at. You're going to cut it through and then look down on it. So we cut through here and we're looking straight at it. And then in short axis, it'll be a circle. So you're cutting through, taking that short axis. If you go back to all the cross-sectional anatomy that we did, it'll come in handy now. Um, another thing is if you want to be a sonographer, you want to learn how to speak the language. And again, you are getting a whole lot of stuff in a short period of time. So uh, we use terms to describe what's on a picture. Hyperechoic is going to be bright, and we're only seeing shades of gray in through here generally. So hyperechoic is going to be bright. That will be bone on an image. Think of hyperchild, you know, hyperactive, bright. Hypoechoic is going to be less bright on an image. Anechoic will mean no echoes, and that'll be black, so fluid or blood. And then isoechoic will be lipoma. It'll look the same. It's kind of hard to pick it out on a picture. Um, I always say it's like the funny paper thing where you stare at it and then all of a sudden it pops up. Same thing with here. You're looking, looking. It's like, oh, there it is. And the, it'll pop up at you. This would be, in an image, examples of almost everything in there except lipoma. So this is the echogenicity ladder from anechoic to reflective. This is a supraspinatus tendon. This is not a good supraspinatus tendon. This one is a, is, I was going to say crappy. We use um, some non-medical terms in, sometimes when we're describing things, but the patients understand it. So we go by layers through here. So in the shoulder, there are only going to be a certain number of things. You know your anatomy, so you know starting from the top, you're only going to have a certain number of things in there. You're not going to see the triceps tendons starting from here. And shockingly, you would be surprised at the number of people say, is your going posterior like, is that the triceps? No. So think about where you are and what's in there. If you need to pull out a book, pull it out. So we're going to go through layers here. From the top down, we'll have a little bit of adipose, deltoid muscle, supraspinatus tendon, and bone. This is the supraspinatus tendon. In long axis view, they look like they're forming a beak down on the greater tuberosity. Within this tendon, we have different, different um, echogenicity. We have anechoic is black, anechoic here. And that's not good here because that means there's tearing in this tendon. We have hyperechoic bone through here. The tendon is brighter, so it's hyperechoic, and then the deltoid muscle is hypoechoic. It's a little less bright. Uh, within this two, we have some reflective. So calcifications uh, will, will reflect and will cut off the signal below it. So it's only knowing what these different terms mean. And that's what we teach you in course two. There are basics. Now, they don't expect us as PTs Real sonographers, the ones who do general and OB, are the brilliant sonographers. They figure we're not smart enough to know all this physics stuff, so we don't need to take the physics exam. But there are certain principles that we teach um, to be able to know as you look at an image what you're seeing and how to create the best image on the screen too. So this is a uh, this is the appearance of a tendon, and tendons are just beautiful when they are good, healthy tendons and you know, we don't see tons of those. Uh, this is the appearance that we'll get. So they are long fibrillar fibers. They are strands of fibers going on. They're very compact. 
which gives it that hyperechoic appearance. Above this, this is the biceps tendon. Above that is the deltoid muscle. And you can see it's not as fibered. It's not as long strands of fibers as the tendon is. Above that, we have just a little bit of adipose. This is obviously not my shoulder. Uh, on the knee, we have patella, and patella stops the bone. I mean, it's a bone, so it stops the signal. So signal here, or bone here, no signal below it. When you see perfectly black below, if you see white, if you see anything, it means nothing because you have a bone stopping that. We are looking from bone and what's above bone. Now, on the other hand, we're now in the joint. So patella here, femur will be below, tibia to the right. So we can actually see through some of the space. So fat pad under here, but this is patella tendon. And you can see the shades of gray as you look at them start to make a little bit of sense. And again, it's if you know where you are and what you're, you know, where you're at, you should be able to pick these things out. Um, one thing that's a little bit unique to um, ultrasound or to MSK ultrasound is the term called anisotropy, and we bring that up. Um, because it is the, it's the challenge. You know, it's not a bad thing. It can be used, it's kind of like, it can be used for good. Uh, but it is you, it means that you need to be exactly perpendicular to the structure that you're looking at. We don't do a lot of this motion. We want to be perpendicular. And um, that's what's hard for other sonographers to do is because they're used to doing these kind of motions. But because everything we look at is very superficial and a lot of it's compact, if you go off angle to that at all, you're going to create it. You can create a false image. And that's the problem is you can create pathology in an area where there is none, or you can take away pathology if there is some, if you are not. So it's important that we look at things in two views also. So this is a biceps tendon. So again, we'll follow the layers down, a little bit of adipose, deltoid muscle. This is bone underneath, uh, fluid around the biceps tendon. And you can see the perfectly white tendon in through there. Now, what I'm gonna do is rock this up and down to go a little bit off angle. And you'll see what happens to the appearance of the tendon. Look at this. So by simply going off angle, the beam going through there is not getting the best image and it's creating a false appearance in there. So if you sent this into a radiologist, there are other signs that it's probably not torn, but this shows a tear where there is not one. So just by rocking the probe, you can change the image. And your question may be, yes, there is fluid around that tendon. Okay, ultrasound machines in, just in general, we'll run through this real quick. Um, machines can range from $450,000 to about two grand, uh, which is awesome. Over the years, they have only had the big machines available, unfortunately, so it was out of range. No PT, no ATC, you know, even a general practitioner to use this could hardly afford to have an ultrasound machine in a practice. But with the advent of the handheld machines, and there are tons of them, it's made it um, an affordable option to have in a clinic. And the image that you have to keep in mind, a machine that costs $450,000 here is going to have the bells, the whistles, the image, the everything. They'll have 13 probes with it and all kinds of stuff. So the image that is gonna be, a, with that one, is gonna be a whole lot different than what you get on a handheld machine. On the other hand, you get a good image with a handheld machine that you can see what's going on, that you can screen your patients to determine, hey, can I treat this or do I need to send it out? Um, these are laptops. This is kind of an in-between, um, the different ones. So these are about, you know, between two and $5,000. This is $400,000. These are 35 to 40. But to start with, with the handhelds, um, whatever you choose in there, a variety. Again, we're not pushing any ultrasounds, but uh, there are so many of them around now. 
you can get the idea, you know, that you can have this in your practice to use. And then as you get better, if you find out this is becoming a big part of your practice, feel, you know, you can always move on to get more diagnostic with this. All right, we are going to now, I'm going to move into shoulder. I'm going to show you what a scan looks like, how we do this. And shoulder seems to be the one that everybody wants to learn to do when I teach. And when most people do, shoulder is the first thing we go through. It's hard. Um, it, it's a little more challenging than what you think to get every one of the tendons correct. But it is uh, the one that pretty much, if you can do a good shoulder, you can do anything. So that's what we start with. So the main thing is to have when you are starting a protocol. Shoulder, we generally do a full protocol, which means you run through the biceps, the subscap, the supraspinatus, the infra and the teres, the AC joint, and then check for impingement. In some of the other areas, it may be a more focused exam. In the elbow, uh, you may only have a patient that comes in with lateral elbow pain. You probably only look at the lateral elbow. Um, in the foot and ankle, maybe just the plantar fascia, but in the shoulder, we do a full exam pretty much every time. We're gonna do two views of everything, short axis, long axis. Um, in the subscap, we're also gonna look at the glenerohumeral joint, supraspinatus, run through the whole thing. Terry's minor, we don't look at too much. It doesn't tend to get as injured as anything else. You kind of got to get chopped underneath to tear that thing. Although weightlifters, I think, can do some crazy, and crossfitters probably. Uh, and then we'll look at the posterior labrum. Then the AC joint, going to go across bones and check for impingement. And I do have a model coming in in just a little bit. We'll do a demo so you can see this. Um, in the meantime, this is my son. He has been my, I like to pointed out, he has been my demo model for, I don't know, 15, 16 years, ever since I started doing this almost. Um, he did not start out with tattoos. And that does say, the front one is for the love of music, and then you'll see the big drum set on the back in a minute. But he is very good about letting me do this. So in starting to do this, we you need to know positioning. We are looking at them in certain positions, and generally it's gonna be a stretch position. In the biceps, this is pretty neutral, but we're gonna have legs down, uncrossed, short axis across the bicipital groove, okay? His hand is just in a neutral position. Then for a long axis, gonna rotate that 90. Now, what I suggest is when you are new at scanning, and if you're having a hard time, finding something, if you've located it in one view, and especially the biceps, don't look at the screen when you're, when you're switching, when you're changing views, look at the probe. You'll get there 95% of the time if you got your good view and just look at the probe and rotate it, instead of looking at the screen and trying to work your way around. That, that's a little tip for today. This is what you'll see. Top of the screen is a little adipose, following the layers down. We have the deltoid, we have the bicipital groove, biceps tendon in the middle, greater tuberosity to the right, lesser tuberosity to the left. Now in this image, something that should be brought up, there is a notch on every probe, I maybe can't see it there, that corresponds to the left-hand side of the screen. Everyone will have a different, that can be talked about during training, but um, the orientation is what you need to keep in mind so you always know where you are. I know because of how I do stuff, this is the lesser tuberosity, this is the greater. And in this view, the subscapularis pops right up. So now I'm going to look at this and look at the probe, rotate it 90 degrees, and get this beautiful view of a long axis of a biceps tendon. And unfortunately, most of your patients won't have this beautiful tendon. So we'll start from the bottom up. We have humerus, biceps tendon, deltoid muscle, and a little bit of adipose on top. Okay, for subscapularis, we're going to start, and actually what you do is start with the hand in neutral position, find that short axis biceps again, then externally rotate the arm, and you'll see the subscap come into view. Once you've got that, you'll rotate the probe 90 degrees and get your sh short axis of the, sub of the subscap. And here's what you'll see. So bicipital groove is here. The arm has been externally rotated. This is the subscapularis. And you'll see they look like beaks. They actually kind of come down flat. 
but because we're only getting one slice, it looks like a beak. So we have humerus, lesser tuberosity, subscapularis, deltoid muscle, and a little bit of adipose. To the right, once this is turned to short axis, this is the subscapularis and short axis. And interestingly, the subscap is a multi-pennant tendon um, for far too long. Uh, I got this wrong. I thought there were all kinds of tears in the subscap at first. Again, didn't have anybody to bounce it off of, but it is actually multi-pennant. This is a normal appearance in this tendon. So um, don't mistake this for tears. Supraspinatus is the top one. Uh, hand behind the back, it's called the crass or modified crass. You want it like your hand is going in your back pocket. Uh, and most patients can do that if they keep it low. When you ask a patient to put the hand behind the back, they think they have to you know, put it way up the back, but they don't need to. This can go down into the, like the back pocket. If you have a hard time, the only person who will have an issue with this generally is someone with adhesive capsulitis who can't move. So the hand can just be left at the side and you can work around that. But we're going, I call it a seat belt position, but the probe is pretty much in line with the humerus. Start real medial and work your way out because you don't want to go too lateral, you'll end up on the infraspinatus. Once you've got that, you'll go to a short axis view and look for the rotator interval. Okay, and this is your image. And again, such a pretty tendon. Comes down to another point. This is the greater tuberosity this time anatomical neck, articular surface, tendon, beautiful deltoid, and a little bit of fat. Short axis view, we have coracoid. Biceps is your landmark in through there. This is the interval. This isn't the best picture, but this is the rotator interval. This is the supraspinatus. And then the last third over here is gonna be infraspinatus. Um, for infra and for teres, hand across the body going to start where the insertion is and follow it posterior. And there you can see the drum set. So following this posterior to the joint. And here's what you see. This is one long picture. So greater tuberosity, tendon coming all the way back into the posterior labrum. This is the glenoid and this is infraspinatus. Trick to this, and we'll show you in the demo, is movement. You want to constantly be moving. That's how you know, especially in areas where there are several tendons or several muscles there, that's how you'll know where you are, is by using the motion that that muscle does and see the action, and that will help you locate what you're looking at. I'm going to run through some pathology real quick, uh, so you can see the sort of things that you would be looking for. That the, These are normal pictures. Most of your patients won't have it. Even doing demos, most people don't have fully normal pathology. And that brings up an, another point that so many of the things I found over the years are acute flare-ups of chronic conditions. Patients don't, we don't see a lot of just acute things that the brand new tear, those happen when you're in your teens and 20s and when you're younger. And think back to where you were let's see, drinking and fell down the stairs or decided riding a mechanical bull was a really good idea. And you got tossed off of the thing and you fell on your shoulder and it's like, oh my gosh, this really hurts. Or you sprained your ankle. Two weeks later, you have forgotten what happened. So that's why it's important to get a history of what's going on because those things will come back. It may have killed you at the time, but you're young and it took care of itself. But now as you've gotten older, how many times do you get a patient in that says, I have no idea what happened. I woke up this morning and I couldn't move. And it takes some questioning to get them to, oh yeah, when I was in high school, I played tackle football or I played lacrosse or you know, anything like that. So we see a lot of fibrotic tissue. We see a lot of scar tissue. We see a lot of that kind in there, but we'll get acute um, flare ups or injuries on top of chronic conditions. So here is pathology, little bit of fluid around there. Not much, but explains pain. And patients also just want to know why they hurt. It may not be horrible, but they want to know what's going on. Um, same thing here, long view, there's a little bit of fluid there. This is a lot of fluid. This would be a boatload of fluid around this tendon. The tendons also change some shape. The transverse humeral ligament has lifted up. 
but right through there. So lots of fluid. This correlates pretty highly with uh, rotator cuff pathology. In a long axis view, there's all your fluid. The tendon's actually intact. It's a little misshapen, but it's intact. This one is a subluxing, probably dislocating tendon. And you can see, it, among other things, all the arthritic changes along through the bone. This just, let's go backward. So we talked about good versus bad, pretty picture versus crappy picture. This is a pretty picture. This one's a cute picture. This is an ugly picture. So is this. These are things that you know, you may want to be a little more concerned about. This is starting to sublux. The bone is very irregular. The deltoid doesn't even look good. Um, over here, little bit of bursal fluid right through there. This is why you need the history. This is an absent tendon. Now, the question is, why is it absent? Did someone tear it? When you see all the arthritic changes here, it could be from, you know, that someone just, it popped. One day it went boom. Um, it could be that there was a surgical intervention in this. So it's important to get all the history um, of the patient to know this. I'm gonna guess here, well, actually I know, this was a surgical intervention because this is where they tacked that down. But even when a tendon, Achilles, biceps, anything is completely ruptured, you will still have a little bit of scar tissue in, in there. And when you're scanning, you're always looking for normal. That should be, you're looking to see something normal. So when the abnormal pops up, it's like, oh, okay. But always look for normal. Don't go in looking for abnormal. Go in looking for normal. And that way, when the abnormal pops up, it'll show up even better. Supraspinatus, nice, healthy, pretty. This is not as pretty. Well, you know, sort of cute or it, what is it? Good personality. So in this tendon, we're seeing a hypoechoic area several of them. So there is some partial tearing in this tendon. Uh, short axis view, again, thickening in through there. But the tendon's intact. It maintains its good shape in through here. A uh, little more here, calcification. And something about calcifications, if you can still see through this, these can be needled. Um, they can be fenestrated. It, providers can take a needle and go in and tap away at those. It's awesome to watch. Uh, the patients don't like it so much, it kind of hurts, but it's fun if you're on the other end of it, watching the needle go in. And you tap, 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 and then you can draw out the stuff from it. So again, take a look at the consistency of this. The tendon is still intact, fraying of the tendon around that. Very swollen tendon. This would be a ten tendinosis. The term that we're hearing a lot of now is, you know, lack of fibers in there. They just start to kind of look like jelly. This is a hard calcification coming through there. You can see the shadowing down. This is a pretty gnarly looking tendon. Uh, this is a bursa. We don't see as many bursas as what you think. This is a true bursitis. The tendon itself looks like, doesn't look that great. But the, this is mostly to show the bursa. This is where the bursal sac is. It is not a giant sac in the back of the shoulder. It is a very defined space. Netter makes it look like it. they're huge but they're actually quite small unless they have fluid in them. This is a full thickness retracted tear. The first time you see something like this, it'll absolutely throw you. The reason we know the deltoid is sitting on top of the humerus. This is a chronic condition. These patients will fool you because most of the time they've had this for a long, long time. They've developed um, the um, deltoid muscle so much. I had a champion female tennis player. She was in her 70s completely torn, tendon was completely ripped, but her deltoid was so strong, she still was winning championships. So, oh, and I've realized I need to get new pictures. So we are going to do a live demo now. I think my model is here. I hear her. All right. Um, there we go. Hi, come on over. This is Janesta. She has agreed to be our lovely model here today. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna run through, and I'll have you face the front here, thank you. Okay, a couple of things, and I'll just give you our, um, how we went through how to do a protocol. So this is to remember what you're doing, and this is the hardest thing, is do you have any money for the biceps tendon? 
I don't know. We'll help you look at subscap. Let me check if you put your hand in your back pocket. And yes, I do. Pat yourself on the back. And that will get you through the entire scan. And that comes from a friend of mine who um, thought that up a long time ago, but it does help you get through uh, doing a scan. So I'm going to face this right here. Let's see if we are. Oh, good. All right. And so the two things that we tend to change on a screen are um, our gain, which is brightness, and depth, which is which is how big or small the image is on here. So we'll see. This this is not going to give you the best view of what's going on. And always make sure your patient is in a comfortable chair without arms, preferably, because you need to do the external rotation. We generally don't put them on rolling stools. Janessa's young, so she won't fly away. But be careful of the older patients on a rolling stool. But make sure you have access to the shoulder. I'm not a fan of pulling the shirt up. You need to have full access to anything that you're, sorry, that you're going to scan. So I'm going to have my notch facing the right shoulder. I'm going to plop this down and right away. We can see, I'll see if I can point here. Subset, this is a deltoid muscle, biceps tendon in the middle, subscapularis shows right in view. And this is the ooh-ah moment. Watch this. This is why we do ultrasound. This is the absolute, for all the years of doing this, this is still like the absolute coolest. Patients, absolutely. That's the other thing that you can't discount is patients love this. To see this motion go on. I can tell Janessa is just loving every second of this. And now follow it down. There is the Peck major coming into view. Come back up. I'm going to look at this, rotate it 90 degrees. And there is a long axis of the biceps tendon, and we can follow that down. Massive biceps tendon. There we go. And you can see, look at the beautiful muscle in there too. It just is so pretty. And when it's, and this is it, we're looking for even, we're looking for normal. That's so if anything is outside of that realm, it'll just pop up at you. Now we didn't do a pre-scan on Janesta, so hopefully she doesn't have anything that'll be a surprise. Top of the other side. Oh, okay, good. So now we're into subscapularis. I'm going to move a little medial and superior. There's the coracoid popping into view. And now you've got your anterior glenohumeral joint. So you can look for impingement in through there with the ligament. Uh, this is an injection spot for physicians, works out really well into the joint. And then I'll rotate 90 degrees. And you can see the bundles, the little pennants in the tendon that show up really well. Okay, and we could just use motion through there. All right, need your hand behind your back, please. Thank you. Okay, this is the tricky one to, oh, thank you, to get correct. So we'll start, we'll see the biceps tendon there, and then, oh. oh. Miss Janesta has got a little bit of calcification. You can see that bright white blob in there. She works out quite a bit. So we're looking for consistency. We're looking for even. One thing you see is the tendon maintains its shape through there. But she does have a little bit of thickened tissue in there, probably from a lot of sports. And a little, you can see an itty bitty bursa up in there, more physiologic than and then short axis, we are into the rotator interval right there. The bright white thing is going to be the biceps tendon. So we have subscap and supra. So we're looking at the interval right through there. When going to the infraspinatus, sometimes you'll need to change the depth. Okay, so insertion, you can see the little insertion, a point there, following it posterior. I'm gonna change the depth. Oh, 
and increase the sorry trying to do this from the side here and there we go so we have the glenoid here and the humerus so if she externally rotates you can see the motion of the humerus and the infraspinatus going through there so you can look down into the joint to see if anything's going on do you mind doing that one more time perfect thank you okay then ac joint on top and for this one you will probably want to decrease the depth a little bit right so clavicle on the left acromion on the right we have the space right down through the middle and we can see just a little roughness along the bone but the joint looks really pretty good and then as we come over the side have humerus supraspinatus acromion and Janessa, i'm going to have you just chicken wing just there you go so we're looking to see if there's any catching any kind of impingement going on in there thank you and that that is a shoulder exam Thank you. Thank you. So, so that that is the shoulder exam. It can be done in less than ten minutes once you get good. Um, it take when you're first starting this, what I suggest is, is to start with um, only doing sections at a time and with any of this. It's overwhelming, honestly, to um, do this. And in the courses, in the courses you go to, if any of you have been to one before, they teach you everything. We try and break it down just a little bit more into simple parts, whole shoulder, but parts of other things because it's more important that you learn how to do a few things really well and then take it from there instead of trying to learn everything and then coming home and not being able to do anything. So the goal is to learn a shoulder. If you can do that, you can translate that into so many other things. But when you're starting with patients, not you hardly ever have time to do, it's like, okay, let me take a half an hour to be able to um, sit down and do that shoulder. Nobody's got that kind of time. Um, it's going to be that you've got five minutes, maybe, or 10, or trying to work it into, you know, your initial event. So a patient comes in, and you're doing everything that you need to. You've asked all the questions, and then you want to just take a look. So look at the biceps. For the next five patients that come in, take a look at their biceps. It'll take you two minutes to run that along there. Yeah, if you've got time, go into the subscap, but just start with one. And then as you go to the next, then you can add subscap to it, or the next time you're going to look at the next 10 supraspinatuses. I'm thinking spinati, but that's not it. So supraspinatus tendons. Um, then you'll look at a bunch of AC joints, and then you can add it together. It's like anything else you do, and before long, you're doing a shoulder in under 10 minutes, probably five minutes, to get an idea of what's going on to be able to determine, hey, I can help you, here's what's happening, you know, we can treat you, we need to send you back, that kind of thing. So it's just a matter of taking the time. It's a slow process. Uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound is not um, a quick learn. If you choose to go into it and decide to, just know that much of your time will be devoted, you'll be frustrated, it took me, I remember it being quite a while before uh, being able to, first off, I was even on my own to do it, but to be able to make sense of these pictures. And even today, like most of you, there are so many things that I learn on a daily basis that, um, that make me, you know, help to make me a better sonographer. I see new things every day that I'm scanning, and you will too with what you're doing, but don't be frustrated. There are um, there are resources out there now that there didn't used to be for looking at images and 
um, seeing what's going on and being able to call other people and talk to other people about it. So always take advantage of that. Okay, there we go. So um, in conclusion, the use of musculoskeletal ultrasound in a practice is probably the one of the best things you can do for a practice. Um, if you are patient oriented and determined to get the best for your patients, again, in this day and age with all the healthcare changes that are coming around, it's harder for patients to get MRIs. Um, and in many cases, a musculoskeletal ultrasound will give a quick, accurate idea of what's going on. It enhances patient care. The patients absolutely love it. They will support you in all of this. Um, I've had a number of our students that have gone through that it just, it changes everything that they do because they can now offer a service to patients that they couldn't before. And for the providers, it is a good thing. Let your providers know that you're doing this. They can be your allies in this. Um, the thing is, it does require proper training in order to do it correctly. This is, there are plenty of videos online, but it's like, yeah, you could probably do a heart surgery by watching online videos too. I, it's not the same thing, but, but, you know, but you want to be able to be trained properly. Learning it online with, or learning something without proper training means it's harder to retrain you once you get into a course and do that. I found out the hard way on that one. So it is important to take that time to learn to do what you can. And at WCUI, we have many, many resources. We have a newsletter. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about education or any questions that you might have about musculoskeletal ultrasound in general. So I am going to, we do have time. I'm going to open it up to questions. Let me stop sharing. Uh, okay, if anybody has questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, someone asked a question, how much you, can you charge for an exam? It depends on um, where you are and what your state requires and your license. Now, physicians can charge, uh, there are codes for diagnostic ultrasound that, uh, that can be used. Physical therapists cannot use those codes right now. Uh, so we don't, um, we can't, we can't bill for that yet. This is one of those things that's going through different channels. It's being worked on, but right now not. As far as cash pay price, that's something you can set on your own. Um, anywhere from, you know, 25 to $125, probably, uh, it, depending on what you want to do. I try and keep it very reasonable uh, for doing that. Any other questions? Let me go to the chat and see if. Uh. Yes, the question is, can you perform musculoskeletal ultrasound on any age of child? Yes, you can. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind with children is that they have growth plates. So you need to be aware of that. Um, again, that was something I didn't realize at first where the growth plate, and I thought so many people had um, stress fractures or that kind of thing going on. But, um, but yes, you can definitely look at that. In fact, it is a very good alternative and being looked at in a number of areas because it reduces the radiation, even for fractures and stress fractures. To do an ultrasound first um, is a, um, um, is a is an advantage for the for the children and something that's being looked at. I work with a group in New Orleans that is they're going to be doing ultrasound in the ER, which is pretty cool. There are 15 of these physical therapists who are training to do this, and that is one of their big questions: are for the children that come in, and the emergency room physicians are very excited about the fact that they'll be able to look at musculoskeletal injuries in a child without having to do an x-ray first. Uh, so 
Yes. So, uh, and again, I'm not going to give any information on, I, I can't. I, um, not that I wouldn't, but I, I really can't as far as like billing on top of that. That depends on your state and where you are and what you what you do. So that's something that has to be set out with your insurance companies. Uh, yes, measurements can be taken. We didn't show that, but there is on every ultrasound, there is a setting. Let's go back to this. That you can, there are settings that you can take measurements on there. So we do measure apophysitis, we can measure tears, we can measure size of cysts. So if there's a ganglion cyst or ganglion, it, um, if there is a lipoma, if there is anything that needs a measurement, we can do elliptical measurements of carpal tunnel uh, for the median nerve. That's a big one in through there because they're looking to see is that nerve enlarged, is it pinched, because there are some standard measurements for that. Also for the ulnar nerve at the cubital tunnel, you can measure that also. Um, yes, California PTs can perform musculoskeletal ultrasound. There is something, there is a paper that came out from the, it may have been one of the special interest groups um, that was very timely. It was several years ago that it is, it, it's so ironic because it is, it, it is well within our scope to perform musculoskeletal ultrasound. We just don't bill for it yet. So any PTs in California, in any state can do this. It's whether you can bill for it or not. So the, unfortunately that is the issue. Now I know in California, you can't do dry needling with this, um, but in several other states you can, but you can perform musculoskeletal ultrasound. Uh, one of the things we've done Ed, that we're getting real interest in too are with school groups. This has been, you know, ultrasound. We've worked with several medical schools with some PT schools that it is to bring ultrasound into the beginning of their programs. It puts a whole new light on learning anatomy. Now think about, for those of you who've been out for a while, think about what it would have meant when you were in your anatomy class, if you'd had your cadaver, you had your skeleton, you had pictures, and then you went right over to an ultrasound and were able to move around and see that motion. How much would that have brought it to light to be able to see that? And there are some schools now that are doing this and it makes all the difference. They're really able to solidify in their heads, you know, what exactly is going on? Because you can, you know, you can move the cadaver around a little bit, you can move yourself around, but to see it on yourself with the ultrasound is bringing it all to where people are understanding and getting a more 3D view of what's going on. Uh. Any other questions? I'm not sure what time. Uh, let's see. Trying to think if there is any other pearls of wisdom to give you on musculoskeletal ultrasound, other than the fact that for doing it for 20 plus years, still I am still impressed with every single thing that I see with this. Um, I watch it constantly being utilized. Um, you are able to help the patients. I think the most rewarding is in finding something on a patient that nobody else has been able to see. Um, and because patients don't always want to know the big things. They just want to know if they've got some little thing going on, what is causing that? Um, and with this, because we can focus in and hone in on certain areas, we're not taking that global view of an MRI, we're able to get down to the nitty gritty just a little bit more. So fascial planes, things that are going on, sticking, uh, motion, that kind of things, we're able to completely see with this. And that has made all the difference in the world to so many people. So I think, are we at, Sid, are we at noon? We are. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'd be happy to hear from you. Um, if you send anything, if you have any specific questions for me, if you send it to WCUI, I'll be sure to get it. But thank you very much for your time.
I hope this has it piqued your interest a little bit in learning a little more about musculoskeletal ultrasound, and we are there to help if you need it. Thank you.